Matthew, and today we're going to be going over movie magic budgeting. Our order of events today is we're going to do an introduction to budgeting. During that, I'm going to kind of jump around and talk about some things that I just wouldn't otherwise cover throughout the course of the program. Then we're going to go in and talk about navigation and controls. We'll talk about navigating between the three main levels of the budget, the top sheet, the account level, and the detail level. And I'll give you a bunch of different ways to navigate uh, between those three various views. After that, we'll set up our fringes and our globals. Fringes are like our taxes and guild fees that we'll have to account for in the budget. And then globals are like shortcuts that are going to help us as we put data in a lot of different places within the budget. Then we'll do the fun stuff. We'll go in and do the budget data entry and add a few examples. Uh, I'll do some stuff some different ways so that we can see how to enter stuff in uh, and talk about adding fringes as well at that point. Then we'll move into printing, talk about printing the budget and sharing your budgets out uh, with various people. One of the things we want to do right at the outset is to find some key terms that I'm going to be using throughout this training. These are ones that you may be familiar with or these may be new to you, but we want to make sure that we set this as a foundation. The first one, allowance or allow, this is a commonly used budgeting term used to indicate that although there will be an expense in a certain account, the detail of that expense is unknown. So you're saying I need to allow $500 say for this item. We don't know that that's actually what it's going to cost, but it's saying I'll allow up to $500 for it. Sometimes that's fixed before the budget is locked and you come back after you've gotten a quote and change it to a flat. Other times it's just going to stay there as uh, an allow. In the case of like craft services, you would just keep it as an allow because you don't know how much that's going to cost until someone actually goes to the store and picks up those items. So it's just saying you're going to allow a certain amount of money. Chart of accounts, this is the numbering system used for the cost accounts of a particular company or studio. These include all cost accounts for a production as well as other company accounts. So it's the numbering system, the numbering system that each studio uses. Some are going to use a four digit account string, some will use three, some will use uh, three and then a dash and then two more. Every studio kind of has a different way of doing it. Luckily we have some templates that are going to help us move along in the program and comply with the chart of accounts of various studios. Cost account or the detail level. The detail level of a production budget where information about rate and amount of time for a given item is listed. The cost account tends to be one of the only places in the budget where we're actually adding money. We're saying this person is going to work this many hours and this is their hourly rate and it's going to result in this amount of cost. Other places you might add some money in, as a contingency uh, in our fringes. There are other places but the cost account, the detail level is where you're actually writing stuff out uh, and it's the base level of our budget. FICA, we put this one in here because we do talk about fringes and inevitably someone would wonder what FICA stands for. It stands for the Federal Insurance Contribution Act. This tax is shared equally by the employee and the employer and it's charged as a percentage of gross wages up to a specified amount per year, also known as cutoff or ceiling. FICA is a fringe. Your fringes generally fall into two categories legal statutory benefits and taxes or benefits required by a collective bargaining agreement with a union or guild. These are crucial as those are two organizations that will certainly expect to be paid in a timely manner. So you have to include that money in the budget. The good news about them is there are cutoffs to most fringes, which are the limits on the application of certain fringes or payroll taxes. This stipulates that after you've reached a certain point in your salary uh, or an employee has reached a certain uh, amount in their salary, you don't have to keep taxing beyond that. And most fringes will have some sort of cutoff that we can use. Then you have a global. A global is an alphanumeric symbol for a calculation or value. If you've ever typed in sum in Excel and it added up the entire column for you, that's essentially a global. The difference between doing that in Excel and doing that in Movie Magic Budgeting is we're actually going to build those globals ourselves here in the program to help us. So those are some key terms that I'll be using throughout this training uh, and you can refer to them and rewind back if you have a question on a term that I use. All right, let's go into the program. So I have Movie Magic Budgeting open here and I 
want to start a new budget. I could do a new budget from here, but I'm gonna close out this welcome window just because the first thing I like to do is usually expand my window to take up the whole screen, then go File, New Budget. When we do that, we're gonna get all of these different templates. If you don't see these templates and you have trouble navigating to this area or somehow it got navigated away, uh, know that there is a file path that you can follow uh, through your uh, computer to navigate to those system templates. These templates are just ones that we've built over the years working with various studios. So you'll see, you know, pretty uh, popular studios in here, so a lot of the big names. And you can use any of these templates to comply with the way that they like to do their chart of accounts. Now a couple others that I'd like to point out, academic and academic template. These two are great for what they sound like, great for student projects. I would say these two are also great just as a base or starter template for you to use if you don't know which other one to use. The reason I say that is because they're a little bit more sparse and it's going to be easier to add things to those templates than it will be to take away things from all the other templates. The other one I'd like to call out is this underscore new budget. Though it seems like that would be a pretty, like, oh, well, I just want a new budget. I'm just going to select that one. I wouldn't. Uh, underscore new budget is going to give you a single cell with a blinking cursor in it, and it's really going to assume that you're going to build the entire chart of accounts from scratch. I can't imagine you would want to do that unless you were, say, starting your own studio and had a different way to budget film and television that has never been done before. If that's you, uh, go ahead and use it, but otherwise I think we're going to use one of these templates that already exists in here. Today, for completely arbitrary reasons, I'm going to use DreamWorks features. All right, and here I have my chart of accounts. Here in this area, you can see, here's our budget top sheet. We can see we have our above the line, we have our below the line, and then we have our below the line post, as well as our miscellaneous, like insurance, uh, publicity, and so forth. So I said that the first thing I was going to do before we dived into navigation was talk about some random things here and there in the program. Let's do that. The first one we're going to cover is budget info. So let's go to File, Budget Info. This is where we can enter in some information about this budget. First of all, namely budget title, like train day two, or whatever title that we would like to use. Budget number and revision number, these are for your use. It's up to you what you'd like to put in here. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter as far as the program. The program does not automatically update these figures. It, it doesn't really care what goes in these boxes. It's really just for you to use to collaborate between people. So if you want to denote, you know, 1.0 and not put anything in revision number, that's totally okay. Again, they're for your use. You do have to manually update them if you want to make a change, uh, but feel free to do so. Down here in remarks, we have an area where we can make any remark that we want about this budget that we wouldn't know where else to put it. So I'm going to put, you know, shooting in Los Angeles and New York. I may put some key staff like director Matthew, star Matthew, writer Matthew. It's a one man show. Then we could just put anything that I wouldn't know where else to put this, like need to secure red Porsche. You could also put assumptions here. It's really a free area for you to put any information that you wouldn't know where else to put it in the budget. Anything you put in here can print, and it will print at the very last page of your budget. So the final page will have all these remarks. So that's budget info. Once again, we got there from file, budget info. Up next, let's go to Setup, Budget Preferences. So Setup up at the top, Budget Preferences. Here in this area, we have a ton of different options. And what this uh, controls is you know, how things look, how things display, uh, how, many, how wide the columns are, where fringes show, 
it's just all these different preferences for how things appear and where they appear. There's nothing in here I would be intimidated by. There's nothing in here that's going to multiply your budget by 10 or do anything crazy like that. This is just an area for you to uh, you know, change the way things look and appear. The main reason why I brought us in here is this is where you can set the budget font. So I'm going to click set budget font. Uh, maybe I want to expand this up to a 16 point size. Maybe I want to go bold, say OK. Note that it won't take any effect until we click OK, and that should then update the font on my budget. So that was set up budget preferences. I recommend exploring this window, and if you ever find yourself frustrated that you, know, you, you can't figure out why these options so, show up here instead of here, I bet it's something in budget preferences. Okay, one more thing to go over. Let's go to setup units. In units, this is where we can see the units that we're going to be using throughout this budget. So for instance, when I type in the letter D in a cell and I tab out, it's going to change that to day, plural is going to be days, and it has a unit equivalency of 12 hours, meaning a day equals 12 hours. On the other hand, F is going to stand for flat, plural is still just a flat, and it has no unit equivalent in hours, meaning it doesn't equal anything in hours. You could change these units, so if you were working somewhere that didn't allow 12 hour days, you could move that to 10. Just be aware that you would have to change both month and week as well as they're assuming a 12 hour workday. You could also add units. Let's say I'm buying yards of fabric or something like that. I could do Y, that will equal yard, plural will be yards, and it has no unit equivalent in hours. It doesn't equal anything in hours. So that's how you can add a unit. That's not very typical. Pretty typically you're going to keep the units that are in here. You might change some of them as far as maybe reels to tapes or something like that. Uh, but pretty typically there's not too many units you would add to this. Anything complex, I would use a global, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, but here, note that you are limited by layers of the alphabet. You can't double up. You can't reuse one that's in use. So that is a limitation. But again, there's not too many you would want to add here. These are the pretty standard units, uh, and they will depend on the template that you're using. One more thing before we move on from units that I want to call attention to is you do have this little print box in the upper left hand corner. If you click that, that'll just print out this table by itself and you can just have this as kind of a cheat sheet of the units that you've created. That's true of most windows in Movie Magic Budgeting that you have this little print box in the upper left hand corner. All right, now we're ready to really dive into this budget. Before I talk about navigation, I just want to mention that there are some minor differences between Mac and PC for these two programs. The first difference is just that on the PC side, you see this Adobe PDF icon. On the Mac side, you won't see that icon. I believe the reasoning for that is that when you print on a Mac, you can do save as PDF from that point, so they figure you just don't need the button. The other difference is that if I ever say use the control key in this training, on a Mac I mean command rather than control. So know that those are kind of interchanged on the Mac side versus the PC. Other than that, the two programs are pretty much the same. So I'm going to give you now six ways to navigate around Movie Magic Budgeting. Uh, I'm cheating a little bit. It's actually five and a half, but you'll see five and a half to six ways to navigate around this program. Method number one. I can click on any category within Movie Magic Budgeting and then click the down arrow on this basketball looking thing. That'll take me deeper into that category, into the accounts within it. I can then click on any of those accounts and click the down arrow to go down to the detail level. Now that I'm at the detail level, that is the bottom level, if I click that it won't take me any further. If I want to go back up, I could click up. If I want to go back up again, I could click up again. 
This is called the nav ball. One thing about the nav ball is while you're on the top sheet, if you click left or right, it's actually going to rotate you through the account. So it's taking me from uh, 2800 to 2900 to 3100 to 3200. So it's just doing that. It's rotating me through. If I go into a category, however, you'll note that it's rotating me still through those different categories from 3100, 3200, 3300. It's just rotating me through. So that's the nav ball, method number one. Method number two is the TAD buttons. Right now I'm on T for top sheet. If I click on, say, director and click A, that will take me into the accounts. If I click on research and click D, that will take me into the de detail level. Top sheet, account level, detail level. If I want to go back up to accounts at this point, I could click the A or I could click the T to go all the way back up to the top sheet. Now the inevitable question is if it's TAD, what the heck is 4? Well, 4 is what's called 4th level. You remember earlier when I said there were 3 levels of a budget, top sheet, account level, detail level? I kind of lied. There could be a 4th level. So, the 4th level is just basically like a sub-account where you can create a, something more detailed than the detail level. Maybe you want to list out uh, cars that you're going to be renting, or maybe you want to do a list of props on hand, or calculate some per diem totals. Those are all great uses of the fourth level. We're not going to really go into this class just because this is a basics run through and that's a little bit more advanced than we'd like to get today. But we do have YouTube videos that go over the fourth level pretty extensively. And after this class, if you want to explore more, we, I highly recommend checking those videos out. All right, so the TAD buttons, that was my second navigation method to navigate me around. Now, the third navigation method, this was where I'm cheating a little bit because it's still in the TAD buttons. If I click on a category while I'm on the top sheet, make sure you're on the top sheet for this. If I click on a category and instead of going into the accounts, I try to skip directly to the detail level, that'll just list all the accounts that are in whatever category I'm clicked on. So you'll see all the different accounts. And if I want to go into Foreman, I just click that account, takes me right to it. So while you're on the top sheet, clicking that D button will show you all the different accounts within whatever you're highlighted on. That was method number three. Method number four, we have this little go box here. This one is most helpful for if you're looking at a printout of your budget and you see a mistake and you want to really quickly go correct that. If you type in an account number in this area and either click go or hit enter, that should take you into that account. So now I'm in 2801 Director of Photography. I could type in 2202, hit that, it would take me into the forming category. So typing in an account will take you in directly to that account. Know that it's just the account string and remember that those could be uh, three numbers, they could be five numbers, they could be four numbers, it just depends on the chart of accounts. Also know that if you type in writers, and either click go or hit enter, it won't know what that is. It's really just looking for the account number. All right, that was the fourth navigation method. Now we go into the fifth navigation method, which is the one that you're probably gonna see me using pretty exclusively today. So if I wanna go into camera, if I double click the gray number to the left of camera, that should take me deeper into that category. If I want to go into first assistant camera, I can double click the gray number three, should take me deeper in. Now that I'm at the detail level, if I double click either of those gray numbers, it should take me back up to the top. So double clicking around this budget will allow you to move around. Okay, that was the fifth navigation method. 
Number six, last one. I can use the arrow keys on my keyboard to move around the budget, just like in Excel. If at any point I hold the control key on a PC or the command key on a Mac, the arrow keys on my keyboard essentially become the nav ball. What I mean by that is if I'm pressing control and holding it and I press it down on my keyboard, that should take me deeper into whatever category I'm highlighted on. If I use the arrows to move down to purchases and press control down, that should take me deeper into the detail level. Now if I want to go back up, I can press control up, control up, and that should take me back up. All right, that was six ways to get around Movie Magic budgeting. Now that we've done that, you should feel pretty comfortable navigating around between different accounts. You can use any of those methods that you wish. Now we're going to go into two areas that we really want to focus on before we start editing a budget, and that is fringes and globals. Let's do fringes first. So I'm going to go into setup fringes. In setup fringes, this is where we're going to be able to build out all of the different fringes that we have in this budget. Now at the top you'll see fringe benefits by percentage, and over here you'll see fringe benefits by flat rate per unit. Now one thing to note is that most of your fringes, a vast majority, are going to be on a percentage basis. It's much more rare for you to have a flat rate per unit fringe. Uh, you do see them, but it's, it's just much more rare. Most of them are going to be on a percentage basis. But you'll note, how do we know what the fringes are? You can click all around here, what is the current rate for FICA? What does the WGA's uh, fringe rates look like? How can we possibly know this stuff? Do I have the resource for you? The Paymaster. This is a book that we put out every year here at Entertainment Partners. It's put out in September. Uh, it's actually no longer a book, it's a PDF. Uh, but you can get this, and it contains all standard industry rates as well as fringes. So it has major cities and their rates there. It's, it's a very, very, very good resource that contains all of the information that you're going to put into this fringe window. And I highly recommend checking it out. Once again, the Paymaster. All right, so for fringes, you would look them up in the Paymaster. You would uh, then type them in. So you would put FICA. For the description, you would put in the actual name of the fringe, Federal Insurance Contribution Act. I'm going to skip ID. I'll come back to it in just a second. You would put in the rate, which for FICA is currently 6.2%. And then for the cutoff, you want to put in the salary cutoff. So you're saying, uh, on this fringe, you need to take 6.2% of whatever a person is making that I apply this to. You need to take 6.2% of that and add it on top of the rest of my budget. But that doesn't just collect on all of their salary. Typically, there's a cap. So uh, you would say it only charges on the first $176,000 that they make in a year. So 6.2% with a cutoff of $176,000. That effectively makes the cap something like $7,800 some dollars. But you don't put that number in here. You put the salary cutoff in here. Let's keep adding some. I'm going to add FUI, which is Federal Unemployment Insurance. For speed's sake, I'm not going to look up every number in the Paymaster at the moment. I'm going to do something you should never do, and I'm going to make up some numbers just to use, just for speed's sake for us today. But it bears mentioning don't ever do that in a budget. So let's just say it's at 2.5% uh, with a cutoff of $7,000. Suey. And you might have different states, so you might want to break them up. So I'll put in SUI CA, which is state unemployment insurance. OK. 
California. And we'll do that at something like 1.7 with a cutoff of 8,000. Now some fringes, if I put in workman's comp, some fringes collect at a rate like 4.03 with no cutoff. They have no cap. And what that'll mean in that instance is that you just leave cutoff blank because it's just saying no matter what, you should take 4.03% and set that aside. That's an example of some taxes that we've added in there. What about guilds? They work exactly the same way. So you would do DGA and you would probably split up DGA into its two sections of pension and then health and welfare. So Directors Guild of America pension and again I don't know what the exact percentage is but let's just say that it's that. All right, Directors Guild of Amer America Health and Welfare. We'll put them at 4.7 with a cutoff of 470,000. Oops. All right. So that's how you would add some of your fringes in there. And note to move between cells, as I was doing, I'm just using the tab key on the keyboard to do that. And that's how I'm getting those new rows, is just by tabbing in between the cells. You could also use the add row and delete row up here to add rows if you wanted. So I skipped over that ID column. I will talk about what the, that means. So in the ID column, right now, when you open up your fringe column on your budget and you've added fringes to the budget, what it's gonna have is it's gonna have all those little acronyms. So it'll have FICA and FUI and SUI and all, all those different little letters next to the line item. Some people don't like that. They think that looks kind of messy. And what they would prefer instead is to give each fringe an ID. So one, two, three, four, five, six, so forth. And when they open up that fringe column in their budget, it's gonna have, instead of all the little letters, little numbers representing each fringe. So it'll say this line has fringes, you know, one, three, four, and six added. And the reason that's convenient is because they'll look in other accounts and make sure that one, three, five and six added, have been added. And they'll open up another one. Oh, one, three, five, and six have been added. And it's just easier to quickly read rather than reading through all the acronyms. It's up to you if you want to use it. Again, if you leave ID blank, it is just going to default to the acronym. Okay. All right, what about a flat rate per unit fringe though? I said that most of them would be on a percentage basis, but not all of them. There are occasions where you have a flat rate per unit fringe. IATSE is one such example, which stands for the International Alliance of Theatrical and Stage Employees. I'll skip the ID column. On a flat rate fringe, this is where they say something like, for each IATSE member, you have to give us $8 per hour for every hour of the first 80 they work. That's something you can't really do as a percentage because it's per hour and it has an hourly cap. So you're gonna put it in like this. You're gonna put in eight for $8. In the units column, this is where I, you could just put in an H and tab out, and it should change it to per hour. The last thing to mention on a flat rate fringe is that the cutoff works a little bit differently. It's not a salary cap like up here. The salary, uh, the cap on a fringe benefit by flat rate refers to how many units is the cap. So what is the uh, maximum amount of units that we could apply this $8 per hour to, or the maximum amount of hours we could apply this to? Uh, let's say that it's uh, 
you know, 70 hours, you would just put in 70. So you're saying $8 per hour, but you should stop collecting it when they have worked 70 hours. So that's how you would do a flat rate fringe rather than a percentage-based fringe. All right. All right, so we want to move on from here. We're done with our adding our fringes. We can always come back and add more, but let's say that we're done for now. I'm just going to say, OK. Great. That's fringes. Now we're going to add some globals. Now before we do that, I want to talk about what is a global? Why would we use a global? Well, in our budget, we can go into various accounts and we can type in that Joe is going to work uh, 20 days of prep. And I could go into another account and say, uh, you know, in this account, uh, Jill is going to work also 20 days of prep. So if I know that my prep is 20 days, I'm just writing it out in everyone's account that so-and-so is going to work, uh, you know, 20 days. That's fine. This is a fine way of doing things. The problem with this is what happens when I send this to be financed and they come back and say, 20 days, that's crazy. You mean 15 days. You're going to work 15 days of prep. Well, now I'm stuck because now I'm going to have to go back to every single place in the budget where I've written 20 days and I'm going to have to change that number to a 15. And that could be 200 places in my budget where I've said the number 20. So it's easier and more efficient to create that as a global. Let's do that. I'm going to go to Setup Globals. Here in Globals, you can click all around here. It's not going to let you add anything until you click this single globe and plus sign. When you click that, now you're building a global. And I'm going to create one called PD. And that's going to stand for Prep Days. The calculation for a global can be as simple or as complex as you want. The calculation for this is going to be 20 D for days. So we've just told the system that every time I use the letters PD, you should know that they equal 20 days, that that's what that equals. And when I write the line item out, I'm going to write Joe is working PD. And I'll show you what that looks like. So now if I go into a line item, and I'm going to set somebody up, I'll say Bob is working P. And note that once I even start typing, it starts to try to help me along and say, oh, I, I bet I know what you're trying to say. I bet it's PD. And if I tab out, it should change it to 20 days. It puts a little globe there to show me that I'm using a global. And if I click back on the number, it should show me the letters. So now, if I ever have to change what prep days equals, I just go back into Setup Globals and I can change this number and everywhere I've used pre PD just filters throughout my budget and it changes every instance. Let's create some more globals. I'm just going to tab down, so rather than use the single globe and plus sign, I'm just tabbing down to create another one. Now one catch about globals is if I want to go back and edit prep days, it's going to get really kind of cranky with me that I am not finishing this global, that I'm trying to go backward. It really doesn't like that. So what it wants me to do is either finish creating this global, once you start it really wants you to finish, or hit escape to pop back out of that and pop back up. All right, I'm going to create some other ones. So I'm going to do SD. That's going to stand for shoot days. And let's say we're doing uh, 40 days. Now I want to do post days, but I'm already using PD. So in this instance, I'm going to put in WD and I'm going to do wrap days and we'll do 15 D for days. So we've just set up prep days, shoot days, and wrap days as globals. And now when I fill out who's working what in my budget, I can just use those letters to represent the amount of time they're working. 
Now, one cool thing you can do at this point is you can use globals in the creation of a new global. And I'll show you what I mean. Let's do TWD, which is going to stand for total workdays. And the global is going to be made up of other globals. So I'm going to do PD plus SD plus WD. And as soon as I tab out, that should equal 75. And again, D for days. Globals aren't just for days. You could put these in for people's hours. You could put these in for weeks, shooting weeks. You know, you could do any kind of global you wanted. And that's how complex these could get because you could have a local team that's shooting this many days and a distant team that's shooting this many days. There could be a lot of different ways that you have to put this information in. You can also use this for things other than just time. I could put in GAF, and that's going to stand for gaffer's rate. And I happen to know that a gaffer's hourly rate, according to the paymaster, is $41.76 an hour. One catch, by the way, is when you put a monetary amount in, in as a global, know that you don't need to put anything in units. The reason you don't need to put anything in units is the only place you're going to use this is within the rate column, and that's always money. It's never anything other than money. So you're, you're only going to use it in that column, and it's always going to know that number is money, so you don't need to put anything in units. You do need to do something else, however. Right now, with budgeting, it's an estimative program. So when it sees a number like 4176, budgeting says, oh yeah, I got it, 42. And you could delete it out and you could retype it 4176 and budgeting would say, no, 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 I get it, it's 42, I got you, man. That's not going to be great for us in, mo in many instances. If we've written 1.5 weeks, we don't want it to assume two weeks. That's going to really kind of balloon a lot of our cost. So I have to tell it how many points to preserve after the decimal point. In this instance, I'm going to say two because I want it to preserve two points after the decimal, and that will preserve the number uh, to that uh, effect. If it was 1.5 weeks, we would need to put in a 1. So now we've created a gaffer's rate, and we've made sure that it's not going to round that number. Now we can do something else with this. Again, if I want to put in gaff OT, I can now use this gaffer's rate to create a gaffer's overtime rate. And the calculation for that will be, again, made up of other globals, so gaff times 1.5, and that should equal $62.64. All I have to do is put in a 2 to make sure that it doesn't round that figure. The last column I want to mention on here is that you have these this D checkbox, and what this is going to represent is if you type in PD and you tab out of that cell or move out of that cell, it's going to change it to showing you the value, which is 20. That's okay, that's a fine way to do it. If you click back on it, it's gonna show you the letters again, but while you're clicked off of it, it will always show you the value. Some people find that a little bit disorienting because they wanna always see the letters, they wanna always know which global they're using. If you check this D box, it will always show you the letters. It will calculate that value as still as 20, but it's gonna preserve showing you the letters rather than showing you the number. All right, that's globals. Uh, it's an easy way to set up things that are global across your budget, are universal across your budget, and they're really going to save you time. Unfortunately, I find the best way to learn globals is to do them wrong once, because when you have to edit 200 line items because you know your boss told you to shorten the amount of shoot days and you're scrambling to go through and edit all these, you're going to remember, oh, I should have created a global. So unfortunately, uh, I find that's the best way to cement that knowledge. I hope it doesn't happen to you. So.
Now we're ready to go in and start creating some line items. One side note before we do that on fringes and globals is just that at this point, after I've filled out all my fringes and after I've filled out all my globals, I would do a save as. I would go to file, save as, and just put this somewhere in my computer so that I can access it later with just a bare budget with fringes and globals added. That way I can start from that budget the next time and it's gonna be a lot easier to just correct some of those numbers than it will be to have to retype all those numbers. So I highly recommend that as a workflow. All right, now we're ready to do those line items. Let's just do a really basic line item. We're gonna do a, a Fisher Price, uh, my first line item. A little TM, Fisher Price TM, my first line item. <laughs> so to do that, let's go into construction, which is account 2200. Let's go into construction materials, which is account 2205. So we're in account 2205. Now one note before we start adding a line, or actually a couple notes. First one, uh, you can move these cells and expand them to make them wider. This won't change how it prints, so it's really a personal preference on how you like to look at this information. If you like it all scrunched up, you can scrunch it all up. If you like it really kind of wide, go for it. Uh, it really just depends on how you like to view these columns. So. I have these different columns and I want to set up a line on them. The second point that I want to make before we do that is I'm going to do what's called burn a line. And that means before I start adding line items, I move down to the second line. That's going to put a space between the account header and the line item and it's going to look really, really pretty. So trust me on this. It's going to look really, really pretty. So let's put in lumber. We're going to do one F for flat. We don't need to multiply it by anything because it's just one. So one flat times one uh, of $500. So we've set lumber one flat of 500. Easy. That's $500 that we've just added to the budget and $500 that, that will be in our totals. Easy peasy. Let's go back up to the top sheet. You'll see there's our 500 and we're ready to go with the lumber. All right, let's get a little bit more complex in regards to these line items that we're setting up. We're gonna build out a UPM. So we're gonna go into production staff, production manager, which is account 2001. And I'm gonna tab down to the second line, burning a line. And I'm gonna put in uh, Jill, Jill the UPM. So Jill, uh, let's say that Jill is working three different rates. Uh, she's working at three different rates based on whether it's prep, shoot, or post. So I can't just write that out as one line item. I've got to divide that up. Let's do that. I'm going to do prep. So that first line, I'm just going to keep it as Jill the UPM. I'm not even going to put anything on that. I'm just going to tab down to the next line and put prep. The amount of prep she's going to work, that's where we get to use our global. So I'm going to put in P and it should automatically try to tell me PD. And if I tab out, it should change it to 20 days. Again, it puts a little globe to the left of the line to show I'm using a global. If I click back on the amount, it should tell me that I put in PD. Uh, but while I'm clicked off of it, it should have the number and I'm ready to go. Now I want to put in a rate. I only need to multiply this by one because it's just Jill and she's only going to do it once, so just one. And I want to put in a rate. Now one thing to bear in mind is that I put in 20 days. And if I put in days, I'm going to have to put in a daily rate for this person. So I'm going to make, put in, say, 850. And there you go. Prep 20 days at 850, it's going to equal 17,000. Let's keep going. I'm gonna put in shoot. Again, I'm gonna use a global, so I'm gonna put in SD, 40 days. 
Let's give her a raise. She's going to bump up to 950. And then I can write post, but just have to remember that I put in WD as the global, so that'll be 15, and she'll go down to, say, 900. So we've just built out prep, shoot, and post for Jill, the UPM, and we've put in her rates for those different areas, uh, different sections of the production cycle. Now, I promise there's a method to my madness here. Let's say that Jill gets a car rental. So I'm going to put in car rental. Let's say that she gets that for the duration of the production. So I'm going to use my TWD global. Whoops. I'm going to use my TWD global. Should equal 75 days. Now one thing I want to note, just a side note here, when you're using globals, it, let's say that she got the car rental for the entire production except for the last five days. We can do TWD minus five and it will do that math. Or if I did TWD say slash two, that will divide it by two. So know that with a global, it will treat it as a value and you can just create those, uh, you can just use and treat those as a, a, a kind of an imaginary number. For renting a car, uh, I'm, I don't know, $30, let's say. So we've set that up. We've added all of our prep, shoot, and post. We've added Jill's car rental. Are we done with Jill? There's something very important that we have not done for Jill. Yeah fringes. So let's go ahead and we're going to add our fringes to this. Now do we want to add fringes to all of this? No, we don't want to add fringes to all of this. We don't want to add fringes to that car rental. We only want to add it to prep, shoot, and post. So to get to my fringes, I'm going to click the green F percentage sign up in the ribbon. That will take me to my fringes. Now if I want to put those on prep, shoot, and post, like we said, and not put them on the car rental, I'm going to highlight by clicking and dragging on the gray numbers, prep, shoot, and post, and I'm going to add FICA, uh, FUI, SUI, uh, workers comp, and for a UPM I'll add DGA as well. While I'm clicked on these, we can see that I have a total fringe amount of $13,918. I can tell that fringes have been applied here because they have these little green triangles. And we've added fringes to prep, shoot, and post. Now here's the thing, that's not quite right yet. And it's not because of my made up numbers, there's another reason that that's not quite correct. And it has to do with the way that we've added these fringes. Plus, it's probably one of the most advanced things we're going to talk about today. Note that each of these rows has its own little bracket. You see that? You see how Jill has her own bracket, prep has a bracket, shoot has a bracket, post has a bracket. That's indicating that it thinks that prep is one person, shoot is a second person, and post is a third person. And so when it's trying to hit the fringe cutoffs for these amounts, it's starting over on each line. And so it's never hitting the cutoff because it's just starting over. And so this total of 13,918 is not accurate. So to create a range here of fringes, we have to do that. We have to create what's called a fringe range. There's two ways to do this. First way is within the fringe window, which again we got to via our F percentage. You can click this little green box with the arrow and the blue uh, lines there, or you can also right click on the gray numbers and say make fringe range. Either way they do the same thing and either one I click, note at the moment I'm at 13,918. If I make them a fringe range that's going to drop about $600. I'm now to, to 13,330. You might notice even more dramatic results in your budgets when you create that fringe range because again it's able to hit those cutoffs appropriately. 
So keep an eye on that. Note that you only have to do that when you have someone's lines split up like this into separate, uh, separate uh, sections. If it's just one line item of this person's going to work this many hours and this is their rate, no need to create a fringe range. That's all there is to it. One last note on the fringe range. I could have done a fringe range from two through six to say make fringe range. That will bracket all of that stuff together. And note that it didn't change the amount because it's still not taxing car rental or Jill. It's just saying that this is all one person and that we should still only fringe prep, shoot, and post. I think this makes a little bit more visual sense because you're bracketing all of Jill's stuff, but that's entirely up to you. They will both do the same result. All right, well, what if I want to add a second UPM though? There's a really easy way to do that. I'm going to skip a line. I'm going to burn down to uh, burn lines down to eight and I'm going to highlight all of Jill's stuff. So I'm going to with on the gray numbers drag from two to six there and I'm going to copy them. Edit copy or control C or command C on a Mac. That should copy all of those. You can see that it copied them because it puts this little dotted outline around it. I'm going to go down to a new row and do edit paste. Now I see that I have another UPM. I can make this Bob the UPM and let's have Bob make less. Sorry to all the Bobs out there. nothing personal. All right, so now we have two different UPMs, Jill and Bob, and they have different rates and they're both adding there. Now one thing we're definitely going to want to add in this instance is subtotals and for each person so that I know how much Jill is costing versus how much Bob is costing. Let's do that. Let's add them. So to do that, on the row in between them, on row seven, you're going to right click and you're going to say insert subtotal. If you don't have right click enabled, you can also click on the row, go up to edit and then say insert subtotal. But let's do that. We'll right click insert subtotal. I'll do that under Bob as well. I'll right click insert subtotal. And you can see that I've added subtotals under each line and it's subtotaling to the next subtotal line. So I've got 70,750 for Jill, 66,000 for Bob. And I've got those two subtotals in there. I can tell you that if you don't put subtotals in your budget and you hand a budget to somebody, they're going to ask you to put in subtotals. So why not do it right at the outset? It's very easy to do and it just gives you subtotals for each section and person and thing that you put in here. All right. Okay, if I go back up to my top sheet, we can see that we've got our production staff. We're spending about 140,000. Construction, we're spending about 500. And down here, I have my totals with about $26,000 in fringes. Let's add one more person because I want to stress a, uh, a point here. So let's go into, say, um, you know, let's go into lighting. Let's go into gaffer. Let's say that I have a gaffer and this is um, Sean the gaffer. So Sean is going to work on our production for let's say five days. But in those five days, he's going to work 12 hour days, meaning that he's going to have to have overtime here in the state of California because it's eight hours of regular time and four hours of time and a half. I want to calculate that in my budget and to represent in my budget. So I have to do this one a little bit differently to calculate for the overtime. So I'm going to mix and match these columns to try to get to that number. And I'm going to say that Sean is going to work 14 hours, which again is eight hours of regular time and four hours of time and a half, 
which are really six hours effectively for pay hours. So it's 14 pay hours on a 12 hour day. So I'm gonna say he's gonna work 14 hours. He's gonna do that five times. And I believe I put in a gaffer's rate, which was just gaff. 14 hours times 5, 4176, and that's the correct number. So just know that sometimes you do have to kind of intermix these columns and use these um, it, with, with variable purposes uh, to get the correct number at the end. All right, well, we've added some line items, and I think I've given you enough to be dangerous. Uh, I do want to talk about just a couple more things before we go into printing. One is just adding notes to your budget. So to add notes to your budget, uh, let's say I want to explain the production staff $140,000 I've added. I could click on that cell on the top sheet, and I could click Data Note. And I could say here, I added two UPMs, their rates may change. I get to choose whether or not I want this to print on the budget. If you check this box, include in print report, it will print out on your budget. If you don't check it, it's just gonna live here in the program. So I say, well, I do want that to print on my budget, so I'll check that, and it should come up with a little sticky note there to say, that a note is present on that cell. If you ever see that on a cell and you want to retrieve that note, you can click on that cell, go back to data, go back to note. So that's how you can add notes to your budget. One last thing I want to cover is just this area in the upper right hand corner. This is uh, an area that I like to personally just call the odometer. And it's going to track you uh, based on your activity, it's going to track your activity within this budget. So in the current session, we can see that I've added $165,928. Session is defined as the since the last time I opened this file. So while I've opened this file, this is how much money I've added. The last change I made resulted in adding $2,923. The advantage of this tool is that you can reset it at any point and it will zero those out and now if you want to go in and track the changes that you're making to say hit a benchmark like oh I don't know I, I want to drop $10,000 from my budget you can do that you can go into production staff production manager if I change someone's rates here like $925 we can see that in the current session I've dropped 1,190 and the last change was indeed that 1,190. And so it's going to keep a running total of the activity that you're doing until you hit that benchmark of that $10,000 you're trying to drop. All right, let's go in and talk about printing these budgets. So we're going to go into File, Print Setup. Here in Print Setup is where we can choose the reports that we want to print. Before we do that though, I want to edit my header and footer. So up in the top, if you go into Edit Header Footer, I'm going to edit the top sheet. Some templates do have this placeholder text. You can just delete it out of there, or you can use it. It's entirely up to you. One thing you can do is in the center, I'm going to do Insert Text and I'm going to do budget title. What that will do is pu it puts in a BT in brackets and that indicates that it's gonna pull whatever the title was all the way back from budget info that we did at the very beginning. It's gonna grab that. Same if you put in insert text current date, it's just gonna grab whatever the date was. You do have to edit the top sheet and the rest of the pages of the report independently. You can't do them both at the same time. So for the report, which is the rest of the pages, it puts the page number in the top right hand corner. I could delete that out and put that in the footer in the bottom right by doing the insert text. So I went to footer, insert text, page number, and that will insert it into the bottom right. Now that I've edited my header and footer, I now want to just 
check off the reports that I want to print. So I do want my details, I do want my top sheet, I'd like my accounts, my notes. Let's go ahead and add one of our fringe summaries. Our globals, we haven't done groups or locations, so I'm not going to do those. I'll do my units and my budget information. One last thing before we preview this is that there are three options here in the budget data option. You have print all accounts, suppress empty accounts, or suppress zero total accounts. If you say print all accounts, it's going to print everything. And right now that's going to be pages and pages and pages of blank data. If you say suppress zero total accounts, anywhere where you've, say, made a list of props on hand and haven't put a, a monetary amount to that, it's not going to print it because it says, oh, it doesn't cost anything, so I'm just going to ignore it. The best option for most scenarios is probably going to be suppress empty accounts where you're saying, if I have typed in that account, you should print it. If I haven't physically typed in that account, you shouldn't print it. So it's just going to only print stuff that you have typed in. For my purposes today, because I think I typed in some different accounts while doing some examples, I'm going to do suppress zero totals. I'm going to preview. I can zoom in on this because this may come in kind of small. I'm going to come up here and zoom there. got my top sheet. Note that because I have a note on this cell, it is giving me a little asterisk there to say there is a note later on. If I scroll down, I'll see the different accounts. If I keep scrolling, there is my production staff. Look at that burning a line. It's beautiful. And we've got Jill, we've got Bob, that subtotal. We've got our lumber, our gaffer. We've got our globals, we've got our units, we've got our fringe breakdown summary with totals for each fringe. We've got our production staff. And then at the very end, we should have our remarks. So that's how you can print that out. You would just be hitting print and you can export that out with the options that you select. So today, we've gone over a lot of material. We did an introduction to budgeting where we just kind of jumped around in the program, talked about some random things, some key terms, uh, showed you how to set up your budget info and how to edit your units and so forth. Then we went in and talked about how to navigate around. I gave you six ways to navigate around Movie Magic budgeting. Then we talked about setting up your fringes and adding globals and how both of those are so crucial and important when you're building a budget. Then we did a few examples with budget data entry and talked about how to add a person who has different rates, talked about how to add a person who has to have overtime added. We did all of that and then we went in and printed and talked about getting your budgets out of Movie Magic Budgeting and sharing them with the world. I do want to mention that we have YouTube videos in addition to this one that go over everything I've gone over and much more. So if you do want to dive deeper into Movie Magic Budgeting, check those out. We also do classes here at Entertainment Partners, and if you were interested in them, uh, we do have a schedule up on our website at ep.com. Check it out there. Additionally, you can reach us at training at ep.com or 818-955-4004, and we'd be happy to sign you up for one of our classes. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.